Okay, a very good morning to all of you, ladies and gentlemen. If we could all just take our seats, we'll kick off here. I have to say I'm very pleased to, to be here in Baltimore with all of you, particularly pleased to see that so many of you made it, uh, not least those of you coming in from Detroit or Atlanta and might have faced some, some challenges from an airline that will remain unnamed for the moment. Uh, but next year, we'll talk to Port of Baltimore and with the Maryland Port Authority, maybe we can arrange some inland inland barge services or some alternative routes that, uh, that might, 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 might at least have a backup if we face something like that again. But glad to see everyone could make it and that we're here uh, together again in Baltimore for the third, <clears throat> the third annual Finnish Vehicle Logistics Import-Export Conference, uh, where today we're going to spend, spend the day focusing on developments and changes in Finnish vehicle shipping, port handling, and rural sector across North America. Uh, we've got a great program for you today with some great high-level speakers, plenty of time for networking and discussion. Um, I'll give you a brief rundown to the program uh, for those of you who aren't as familiar for our, with our conferences. Uh, we're going to have three panel discussion sessions uh, this morning and then after lunch, and we'll, we'll finish off the day with a, with a VIP session of uh, car makers on stage for Q&A, &A. And, um, and tonight we're going to we're going to get together at the Pratt Street Ale House around the corner for a reception hosted by the Port of Baltimore. For those of you who may not know me, my name is Christopher Ludwig. I'm the editor of Automotive Logistics and Finnish Vehicle Logistics magazine, uh, working closely with uh, our conference events team, Louis Yakumi, who many of you know, uh, Nimish Ladwa, who's helped put this program together. And uh, we're very pleased, again, to, um, to have you. This is one of my, my favorite events. It's, it's nice and intimate. You get a chance to talk to everybody, really delve into the subject. Uh, and that's not just because Louis isn't here to, uh, steal all the, you know, to not steal all the attention away. It is genuinely a great event. And it, and it wouldn't be possible, of course, if it weren't for our sponsors. So I'd just like to, to take a moment to, to thank them. Uh, our premier sponsor, Port of Baltimore, who we'll be hearing from later. Um, and again, is hosting our reception later today, later this evening. We also have several global sponsors who actually sponsor all of our events around the world, or at least all those relative to Finnish vehicle logistics. And for those of you who don't know, that's a sizable amount nowadays. It's something like 10 or 11. Um, Chang Beijing Changju Logistics, CDC, which is a Chinese-based uh, third-party logistics provider, and uh, convertible trailer manufacturing, CTM. Uh, we're also very pleased to have our gold sponsor, Pacer Group, and our silver sponsors, uh, uh, Confezioni Andrea Group, Metro Distics, Montway Auto Transport, and Proact International. Uh, some of them are set up outside with stands. Everyone is here. There's literature in your, in your delegate bags. Uh, they're ready to talk and, and talk about the services and the specialization that they provide in this, indeed, very niche and, um, and special, session, uh, special subject. Also, just like to highlight quickly, uh, this is one of our Finnish Vehicle Logistics live events. So that means that uh, at the moment, this session is being streamed and distributed online live to, to a global audience. Uh, it also means you can participate uh, in that. You can log on even in this room. Uh, there's space to, to comment, to ask questions, which I can ask to the panel if you like, or you can make comments. Uh, it pulls in directly from Twitter as well. Um, and just as a review, and later on this morning, not this session, but the next session, we're going to do some voting as well, which some of you may be familiar with some of our events. So we will actually ask you to log in. We'll bring that up again at the time, but it would be good if some of you maybe familiarized yourself with the system a little bit. You can follow the link uh, that's up there. It's also in your program, uh, in your program next to the program page. You've got the, the login there, the, <coughs> excuse me, the, the FVL import export.com or the bit.ly link you see there you can log in with and then you just use your email address and your delegate number which is the number right on your badge starting 1179. Any of you who registered for this event which obviously if you're in the room you did you would have also received an email um, this morning telling you uh, about this system you can just follow and click a link right in that email and it'll take you right there. Okay so that's some of the, the housekeeping sort of, sort of out of the way. Um, once again, I think 
we're here at a, a very interesting and, and appropriate time uh, in, in the sort of cycle of the, of the automotive industry and the finished vehicle and uh, row, 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 row sector. Uh, we continue to see a very dynamic, fast-changing, and fascinating market uh, here in North America for obviously automotive production, distribution, import, and export, <clears throat> driven by record sales in the U.S., as, as all of you know, uh, rises in, in regional production, both in the U.S. and perhaps especially uh, with a huge investment in Mexico. Uh, we're also in a period of fast development and change in the broader shipping industry. Uh, just a few weeks ago, obviously, we saw the newly expanded Panama Canal open. Um, and even if row row ships aren't, aren't necessarily to the full size that, that required that, uh, we obviously see a huge trend in, in increasing ship sizes. And at the same time that we're seeing obviously more concern over climate change, <clears throat> regulations that, that will uh, look to regulate and, and reduce emissions and pollution, both at land and at sea, which will of course be very relevant to many people in this room. At the same time that we've been in this period of boom, uh, there are some, some observations naturally around some unsteadiness in the global economy. Uh, you're talking to someone who's living through Brexit, so I can tell you about those. Um, but obviously here in the US, questions about whether we might be at close to or nearing a cyclical peak, and will we have a mild recession, a pullback, something worse, something better. Um, <clears throat> and naturally, what will it mean for finished vehicle logistics, investment, investment in ports, services across, uh, across the region. So I think you know, ports and, and their many stakeholders, because this is a very complicated industry with many authorities and, and, and stakeholders working together, it's uh, an interesting time to, uh, to be making the decisions on future investment, systems, on services, in-link connections, port side technology, um, whatever it is to stay competitive and meet the needs of the global automotive industry. So it's again in, in that context that we've all gathered here uh, in Baltimore. And of course, this morning and, and for the rest of the day, we're going to be talking with a range of experts um, from government, from car makers, from port and logistics operators, from associations um, across the board. And Baltimore is one of the most appropriate locations, I think, given, for one, the city's historic uh, importance as a maritime trading link, and uh, especially for its highly successful development of the Roro and Finnish vehicle trade here. Um, <clears throat> you will have received a copy of our uh, Finnish Vehicle Logistics latest issue, and in there you have our latest port survey, uh, and Baltimore again, the largest, uh, largest port in the US for handling new Finnish vehicle shipments across its public terminals and, and indeed um, even some of the, the private ones that are developing as well. So we see a very interesting and effective operation here, a lot of collaboration across state authorities, federal funding in some areas, a lot of private investment, and obviously participation across the OEMs and logistics providers. Um, naturally, Baltimore and Maryland Port Authority are not uh, the only example of that, but we, we, I think it's a good one, and it'll be, you know, it's a good context for us to, to, uh, to discuss today. And speaking of this sort of funding and collaboration, um, we're going to be hearing a little bit later this morning uh, from the United States Mar Maritime Administration, or, or MARAD, um, for which we're very pleased to welcome Michael Rodriguez, who's the Deputy Administrator. For those of you who don't know, Malrod is responsible for the U.S. Merchant Marine and for maintaining shipbuilding, efficient ports, intermodal and inland connections across the U.S. So I'm uh, very pleased to, to have Mr. Rodriguez here and, and a chance to, to talk a bit more on that side. To start the day, however, we're going we're gonna to go at a high-level economic uh, view and get some, some forecasts and, and some trends to understand a little bit where we're sitting uh, with today's North American global and global automotive industry and drill down a little bit of that in the context of, 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 uh, of finished vehicle shipping and, and RORO within North America. And so I'm very pleased to, to welcome um, Therese Zan Wynn, who's an automotive analyst for PWC Autofax. So without further ado, I'd like to hand the stage over to Therese. Thanks, Christopher. It's really great to be here. I think um, if you're a regular attendee of our um, these Finnish vehicle logistics conferences, you're probably much more familiar 
with my colleague Brandon Mason. He's kind of been our FVL um, representative, but he's unfortunately under the weather a bit. Um, there's a bit of a summer flu going around Detroit, and so unfortunately he wasn't able to make it. Um, but even through some travel and logistics fund myself, we made it here this morning. Um, so very happy to be here and to share a little bit of um, both our forecasts, and Christopher alluded um, a little bit to, um, we're going to share, we've seen it's, it is definitely an interesting time in the industry, both um, from an auto finished vehicle um, assembly and sales standpoint, but also from a logistics standpoint. And we're starting to see quite a bit of an uptick, um, particularly as it relates to Mexico in terms of consulting projects and interest in some of the port and rail development in Mexico. And so we're sharing some high level um, insights to, to wrap up the session um, today as well. So. Let's go ahead and get started. And just from a cadence standpoint, we'll start at a global level. I'll share a few insights um, just at the of the industry as a whole. And then we'll drill down to North America. And then, like I said, have that little focus on Mexico, just because that seems to be um, a very interesting point of conversation in, in many um, conversations that we've had recently, both with you know assembly, the growth in assembly, as well as the logistics behind that. Um, so the first look we have here, um, as you know, Autofax, our bread and butter, is kind of our um, assembly forecast. And so we're going to switch back and forth a little bit um, between assembly and sales, but hopefully I'll make it clear when we're talking assembly versus sales. Um, but this is our global assembly outlook from a top line level. So as you can see, 2015, we finished out at 88.3 million in terms of um, new light vehicle production. And through 2022, which is the extent of our forecast window, um, we expect that to reach 111 million. And I think this is pretty consistent um, growth. There's a lot of talk and a lot of rumblings about have we reached max car park? Um, lots of talk of the ride sharing, car sharing, autonomous vehicles. Is that going to mean the end of the auto industry, at least as we know it today? Um, and while that certainly does mean some significant change, it's already underway. We've seen it. Um, we've heard a lot about um, OEMs partnering up with, with the Ubers, you know, GM's partnership with Lyft, um, Ford getting into a bit of the autom autonomous um, scene themselves with different suppliers and different partnerships. That's certainly happening, um, but we don't see any type of, you know, true penetration in terms of um, having the um, car park, as, as some have suggested, in the coming years. We just don't see that changing, and a lot of it has to do with the emerging markets. Um, so if you think about China and India, there's still a good portion of those populations that are coming just coming into middle class, coming into that first car ownership um, stage in terms of a macroeconomic standpoint. And so those emerging markets, the growth there, the untapped population, if you will, of um, new drivers and new car owners are still going to drive a lot of that growth. And as you can see, that's a huge number. 91.4% of the growth we see between 2015 and 2022 is going to come from those emerging markets. And obviously, a big driver of that is going to be China. Um, Here's a look at our growth, that same top line, um, but from a regional standpoint. So this is how we view the world, I guess, if you can say, in Autofax, um, just by region. We'll get into North America, so I won't spend too much time there, but we'll kind of move from west to east. And unfortunately, that means we have to start the morning off in South America, which has been a lot of um, doom and gloom lately. Um, even with the Olympics, I think the lead up to the Olympics and all of the um, interesting political and, and social unrest there is kind of reflective of the market as a whole. Um, it's kind of hard to believe that just back in 2012 was when Brazil, who's the anchor of, of South America, makes up 80% of, of South American production, um, was just four years ago that Brazil hit its peak, 3.6 million in sales. Um, also its peak in, in assembly as well. And now, four years later, we're seeing um, this year alone, we don't expect sales to even reach 3 million. And so it's been, it's been pretty bad news there in terms of you know, economic, political, social unrest just um, seems to be hampering the once high potential market there. And, and it's interesting in the time that Brazil has kind of gone on its decline, Mexico has been on the rise. And so from a Latin America standpoint, you're seeing kind of a shift in power. It's already occurring. It's already happening. But Brazil definitely um, is, not, is not going to reach the peak that we once had it reaching. Um, as you can see, over that seven-year period, 4.3% of the regional um, 
of the region is contributing to the growth overall. And then you can see down below, it's the delta between 2015 and 2022. Um, we have carved out, as a lead South American analyst for Autofax, we've carved out consistently um, carved out a lot of speculative capacity and investments um, over the past few quarters um, throughout our forecast just because it just doesn't seem like it's going to be able to regain its footing anytime soon. Um, we do expect a recovery to come, but it'll be slow and it won't be nearly um, close to what, what we once saw Brazil potentially reaching um, in the next decade and beyond. EU is an interesting story. Obviously, good news up to this point. Um, through the first six months, sales across the EU are up 9.4%, which is pretty healthy. But of course, Chris alluded to this as well, um, Brexit is kind of the big elephant in the room. And to be fair, with so many variables still outstanding, we don't know what trade is going to be like. We don't know what the agreements between the UK and the EU, how those are going to play out. Um, obviously, it's it's one of the top five markets, 1.7 um, in terms of production, 1.7 million in 2015, and a 2.6 million um, vehicle, new car sales um, market. There's, it's certainly not a drop in the bucket. It's a large market that drives the EU as a top line. Um, and so however this plays out, it's going to have ripple effects, not just across the EU, but obviously in the global um, industry as well. The next two, Eastern Europe, Middle East, and Africa, I guess it's, it's fitting that we kind of talk about those two in general because as different as those regions are, they face a lot of the same issues um, with Eastern Europe that's made up of Russia, Turkey, Ukraine, um, and several other small markets like Kazakhstan. Um, lots of political turmoil and unrest there where we do see growth, not quite, again, not quite what we've seen. Um, if we would have talked two years ago, a lot of companies like GM, for example, choosing to just basically end their investment there, there was a lot of potential going in um, probably about two years ago, but with the um, Crimea conflict, with the economic sanctions that Russia is suffering, coupled with um, a depreciating ruble and low oil prices, that's just a, a market that's going to be suffering for a while. Um, and while we do see it rebounding, again, it's similar to Brazil, it's not going to get quite to um, the high potential that it once promised. Um, the same can be said for Middle East and Africa, particularly for Iran in terms of political instability. So there's a lot of interest in Iran. Um, this is an, a market that's well overdue for, for technology update, for new investment. Um, it's been a close market for so long. And so the potential of the lifting sanctions is very enticing. I mean, this is a market where we're seeing <laughs> 1987 Kias are still being built as new vehicles and sold as new vehicles. Um, that's how outdated their technology is, and that's how ripe they are for, for a bit of a revolution in terms of the automotive industry. Um, so lots of interest at the OE and supplier level to enter um, Iran, but again, that's all, it all hinges upon this very tenuous nuclear deal, and things can turn on a dime between um, Yes, the market's open, and no, the market's close again. So there is a lot of potential there, and we do see that growth. Um, but what we're forecasting is moderate growth, understanding that things, again, can change in a dime in those two regions. Asia Pacific is kind of a tale of two regions. So we talked about the developing markets of China and India kind of being the, the drivers, not just of Asia Pacific, but of global um, growth. And that also includes developing. We, we include ASEAN nations in there, which a bit more volatile, but still some, some growing um, countries there in terms of both production and sales, um, lots of growth potential. And you can see 65, almost 66% of the global growth is coming from just that one region, um, China, India, and ASEAN. Meanwhile, on the other hand, you've got developed Asia Pacific, and that's the only region we have contracted, um, contracting over the forecast window. And that's, we, we consider that three countries, um, Australia, Japan, and South Korea. Now, Australia, from an assembly standpoint, will be ending production and will become purely um, an import market in terms of sales. Um, so that's part of the decline. The other piece is, is interesting is, is South Korea and Japan. So both of those are traditionally huge global assembly hubs. Um, you think of the brands that come out of there, Hyundai, Kia for South Korea, and then, of course, the big um, Japanese brands of Honda, Nissan, Toyota. Those are major hubs, but there are a few similar struggles that both of those markets are facing. So we have a lot of assembly localization. A lot of that investment that we're getting here in both North America and, and abroad as well is coming from directly from Japan and South Korea You know, to minimize some of that supply chain risk. And the whole build where you sell model just makes a lot more sense um, on multiple levels, currency exchange, um, rate risk aversion, um, logistics and, and supply chain interruption aversion, all of that. 
Also, both of the demographics from a sales standpoint in those markets are um, challenging. They are shrinking in terms of population, both South Korea and Japan, and they're also aging. Um, I can't remember the statistic now, but it's a, it's a large, it's a majority share of, of the population in um, Japan is now over 60. And so you're having less and less drivers. And also you're just having you know, a more urbanized um, environment in terms of transportation there. So on the whole, just less buyers from a domestic sales standpoint. And then from an export standpoint, you've got a lot more assembly localization abroad. And so that's why you see that contraction in um, those three countries in developed Asia Pacific. So here, I won't, I won't belabor this. We've talked about it. Obviously, China and India, those are going to be your top two drivers. But you also see the US and, and Mexico, of course, in terms of the top 10. You see the top 10 on the, um, the left there, and then you see the bottom 10. And again, those three countries I just mentioned, South Korea, Japan, and Australia, kind of rounding out the bottom there. And so from a market standpoint, um, again, China is the lion's share of the growth, and they will continue to be um, throughout our forecast window. That same, so this is wrapping up our global section. It's the same um, alliance group look, or the same assembly top line, but looking at it from an alliance group standpoint. Now, when I say alliance group, I mean um, brand family. So GM is going to be included, inclusive of um, Cadillac, Buick, um, Chevy, and GMC. So we're talking brand families here. Overall, even with Dieselgate, we do see Volkswagen maintaining their top position, and that's for several reasons. Um, the resiliency of Audi as a brand um, it continues to help float some of the negative um, developments thanks to the Dieselgate scandal. And also, their strong position in China. Um, we haven't seen as much of an impact there in terms of the, the negative um, from, from Dieselgate. And so we, can, we see that they will continue to hold that um, position as it's in the pecking order. Um, one thing to note, I guess, that may be interesting is the pending transaction between Renault, Nissan, and Mitsubishi um, taking that 34% ownership stake. Now, depending on how Nissan, well, first, depending on clearing the you know, due diligence and compliance hurdles, um, it's still a pending transaction. Um, depending on what Nissan and Renault do with Mitsubishi in terms of portfolio rationalization, if there's going to be some nameplate um, consolidation for, for competing um, models in terms of, you know, between Nissan Stable and Mitsubishi Stable, um, though their present here in, presence here in the U.S. isn't that impressive. You know, I, don't, I can't tell you the last time I saw a Mitsubishi on the road. Um, but even though they're not a great presence here, their global volumes are still, still significant. It's no drop in the bucket. And so if that transaction does merge, and again, depending on how they consolidate and how they rationalize that portfolio combination, um, we could see Nissan potentially um, jumping over GM and, and maybe even Toyota into the second position there, depending again on how the transaction plays out. And then just a quick look from an alternative engine standpoint. So when we say alternative, we mean mild and full hybrids, we mean plug-ins, pure EVs, and fuel cell development. So again, there's a lot of talk around these. You know, green technology always has a bit of a, you know, cachet, if you will, in the press and the media. We've got certain companies run by Elon Musk that are always stealing headlines. You hear a lot about it, but from a volume standpoint, we still haven't really reached mass penetration in terms of you know, consumer acceptance. You, know, you do see, this is at a global level, so 3.5% in 2015. We do see that growing all the way up to 8.5%, but much of that's going to be driven more by Europe. Um, we see greater growth in Europe and also a, a bit of a growth from just a pure volume standpoint um, driven by China as well. And from Europe, there's you know the pending, not that CARB and CAFE aren't pending here in the US, but in Europe, it's a bit more pressing um, for those emission standards. So we are seeing the growth. Consistent growth, impressive growth, but still not going to be that mass you know, adoption that probably about 10, 15 years ago, people were expecting to see um, with, with alternative engines. So we'll kind of pivot now to North America. Um, and take a look at, by country, this is sales. So gray being um, US, red being Canada and Mexico. Canada and Mexico have both had um, consecutive years now of record sales, um, and we expect 2016 to do the same um, for both of those countries. But honestly, it's going to be, they're a drop in the bucket compared to the US from a North America standpoint. The US makes up 84% um, of North American sales. And so when we talk about sales, we primarily are going to focus on um, the U.S. in terms of, you know, numbers. And so what we're looking at next here is our U.S. sales scorecard. So through July, it was interesting, going into sales reporting day on July 2nd, 
there was a lot of pessimism. Ford came out with the, the press release saying, you know, they expected to revise down some of their targets and that the market would be difficult. Um, and then we got revised seasonal um, factors from the BEA, the Bureau of Economic Analysis, and that actually helped bump up some of the numbers. From a SAR standpoint, we reached 17.8, close to 17.8 in terms of SAR. But we do see a starting, we're starting to cool down a bit. Um, one thing to remember, and I think it's, it's, it's easy in a positive environment to forget some of the bad times. This is a cyclical, um, this is a very cyclical industry. And to think that we can continue sustaining the growth that we've had in the past five years at the rates that we've enjoyed them um, is a bit unrealistic. And, and you might see 1.1% year-to-date growth um, through July and think, oh, that's a bit meager, a bit paltry. But 2015 was a record year. Um, so in all, in all accounts, this is still good news um, People, the, the, the OEMs are still enjoying um, growth, it's just going to be at a slower rate. And what we do think is that this is going to be the new normal between 17, 17, 5 is what we should expect. And we do think that the industry, though, is much more prepared, much more able to deal with sales contractions um, and recessions, whether they be major or minor. I think that the, the industry has done a lot of right-sizing and a lot of painful moves from the Great Recession that we are much more prepared um, to be able to handle economic downturns um, should they come. And then this is assembly. So looking at total assembly, this is total North America assembly. Um, and what you see in the gray is excess capacity and utilization. It's always impressive to me to, to look at the utilization number for, for North America. It's just very, very high. You know, generally speaking, we say 70% is break even, 80% is profitable, and we're, we're hovering around 90%. Um, and that this is inclusive of Mexico as well. And so this continues to be a very highly efficient, highly um, utilized region that continues to um, outpace expectations. You know, as much as sales might be cooling down, we don't see any of that happening in terms of assembly. So where is that growth coming from? We do have a few new announced um, plants, for example, Volvo will be coming to um, Charleston, South Carolina in the coming years, but a lot of that's gonna be driven in Mexico. And so what we're sharing here, this next few slides have a little bit of, you know, both from a assembly standpoint, some of the growth and where it's coming from. And we've actually called, we've, like I said, we've been getting a lot more interest in some of the port um, and, and logistics um, type of consulting work. And so we're sharing a few of those high level insights. I'm sure there's gonna be people in the room who can talk to this at a much deeper level than I can. <laughs> but these are just some of the overall trends that we're seeing. So just between 2010 and 2020, this is just how impressive Mexico has been. 2010 to 2015, 50% growth and another 40, 47% growth expected by 2020. That's just, it's very impressive, very significant in terms of local production. Um, this is a bit of a, an eye chart, so I'll let you guys, hopefully I think everyone will be sharing this, um, or everyone will be receiving this, and you can see the details, but it's between the existing plants, about 260,000 in terms of added capacity, as well as 1.3 with new plants, um, across six new plants. That's where we're seeing a lot of the growth um, that makes up that 47% growth by 2020. One thing that we have found that's interesting, and this is actually right from an FVL publication, I believe, is, is how logistics are going to be impacted by this growth in Mexico. You know, this is all good news. You want the growth, but then you start thinking, how are we going to be able to handle this from a logistics standpoint? And, and not just logistics, but, you know, the entire supply chain. But for this, you know, for our purposes here in the room, um, obviously the two major rails um, in Mexico are going to be KCSM and, and um, Ferromex, and both are already starting to feel the constraints of, of capacity. Um, we do expect investments to increase over the next few years, but investments in rail in Mexico are a little bit different in terms of the it, even if you have a right of passage, for example, you have to win local or you have to win local approval of, of the ability to be able to develop those rails um, from a local municipality standpoint. And so it's not just a matter of getting the land and getting the right of passage. It's, it's winning over locals and making sure that the community has buy-in as well. And so while we say that we expect investment, it, it may take a little bit longer um, than, than most would probably we like or, or expect. Um, and so that's going to be a concern going forward. So with this capacity um, constraint, where are we seeing some opportunities? And that comes out of the short C. Um, this is actually, a, this is based on um, a presentation that was shared at a previous FEL um, 
um, conference, I believe it was the supply chain conference, I want to say, and KCSM shared what their calculations are. So we kind of mix those with some of our auto facts expectations. And so if you take, you know, Mexico production, about 82% of that is slated for exports. Um, and then 85% of that is to the U.S. and Canada, um, so northward. Um, and KCSM had shared that of that 85% of the 82%, can you tell them an analyst? <laughs> um, Cross-border rail makes up 87% of that. Now, if we expect you know that much growth between you know 15 and 2020, um, that means a million in terms of incremental. Um, vehicles moving northward between Mexico and the U.S. And so that's going to put quite an interesting strain on both the rail um, methods as well as provide opportunity for ports. Um, now, from a port standpoint, the primary port right now in Mexico, all of Mexico is Veracruz. By far, um, the most value coming in and out of, of, of Mexico is coming through Veracruz. But we are seeing an interest, in, an increase in interest in Lazaro Cardenas, which is on the west side. So Veracruz has the monopoly, I would say, at this point, and, but they're located on the east coast. And so if you can develop and, and get the investments required at Lazaro Cardenas, that would be an interesting um, short sea route all the way up the west coast from Pacific Northwest down to San, San Diego. And that's what we're seeing here. So there's kind of three primary trends that I would share um, that we're seeing come out of this kind of shift or, or need for, for um, innovation in logistics coming out of Mexico. And the first is that short sea, um, it's continuing to grow. You know, even in Baltimore, like we said here in the US, largest port in terms of import and export, we expect that to continue to grow. And even Jacksonville um, handling eight, seven or eight calls a month um, from various lines. It's, already significant and it will continue to grow. Um, the other trend we see kind of emerging is the Gulf Coast. Our Gulf Coast. Um, we do see that Galveston and Freeport have been the um, recipients of recent um, investment from processors. So we've got um, WWL at Galveston, we've got Haig at um, Freeport. And so that's an area that's starting to emerge a bit in terms of a port presence. Um, and then finally, like I alluded to earlier, that Lazaro Cadena's de development will be really important on the West Coast. Um, like from Grace Harbor all the way down to San Diego, there's going to be already some activity at Lazaro Cadena's. Um, their volumes aren't insignificant. Um, three plants there um, between Celaya, Hermosillo, and Salamanca already use that port for exporting um, up to the U.S. West Coast. And so we expect that it'll increasingly be looked to as rail um, becomes a bit more constrained. So I think just to wrap it up, um, what we wanted to share here was just some overall highlights. But what you can see is just even the tiniest shift in automotive production and overall um, at a top line level can have that domino and trickle down effect to the entire supply chain, particularly to logistics. And so it's important um, to recognize these changes, to prepare for these changes. And it's a good time. I guess the, the thing that I want to leave with is that it's still a great time. As, as much as we hear about cooling down of sales, it's still, from an assembly standpoint, a very good place to be. It's a very great um, industry to be in. And as an analyst, it's a very interesting time to keep my eye on the market. So I look forward to any of your questions during the panel. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. Teresa and uh, a very thorough and, and interesting presentation. They're giving us an outlook on, on what's going on across the world and obviously a focus here on North America. Uh, I won't just repeat the points, but as, as we've kind of talked about, maybe we're in a cyclical, coming into a cyclical downturn or shift here, but, um, but still quite positive with assembly still growing. And, and you see the situation there in Mexico. Um, it is it is impressive what's happening and all the investment that continues to go there and, and, and the developments we're seeing on the logistics side are, are indeed very significant. Of course, we hold events there as well and, uh, and look forward to continue to, to talk more about Mexico today, uh, I'm sure, as well. Um, we're also very pleased, obviously, this morning, and, and obviously some of these subjects, by the way, we're going to delve into in a little bit more depth uh, in, in session two and three, I believe. Uh, but of course, we're very pleased to have this morning Michael Rodriguez, who um, is going to give us a, a viewpoint from, from the Maritime Administration, and uh, it's just part of the U.S. Department of Transportation. 
As I mentioned earlier, the, the Maritime Administration is an important uh, regulatory body responsible for American waterborne uh, transport sector, both from the perspective of commercial traffic as well as for national security concerns. Um, it's a body that plays a, an important role in the oversight um, as well as provision of, of some federal funding as well, for example, TIGER grants, which I think we'll hear a bit more from, from the deputy. And of course, this is also important in the context of the, uh, the passing late last year of the Fixing America's Surface Transportation Act or the FAST Act, uh, which set aside uh, a significant investment um, for over a long-term period, which is something obviously um, which is very critical for, for the transport infrastructure here in the US. Uh, Mr. Mr. Rodriguez has been Deputy Maritime Administrator since 2014, uh, which follows a 35-year career uh, of public and private maritime industry experience, which has included, included time with the Merchant Marines and later as an engineer and training representative at the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy, uh, as well as later with the International Organization of Masters, Mates, and Pilots. Uh, before joining Marad most recently, he also worked on the U.S. House Representative Subcommittee on Coast Guard and Maritime Transportation. All that to say he is extremely well placed to discuss uh, issues around maritime trade and, and issues here. And um, it is my pleasure now to, to hand the floor over to the deputy. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for your introduction, Chris, and um, thank you, uh, thank you all for your your welcome. Um, I do want to make one comment, and I, and I, I speak at, at gatherings like this now and then, but there's one there's one thing that happens. There seems to to be a trend at each one of them. No one sits in the front row. It's, it, it reminds me of junior high school. Um, no one wanted to sit in the front row because the, the teacher might call on you, but I may call on John Kennedy who is our uh, Mid-Atlantic Gateway Director. Um, but later on when we get into our discussions, uh, John can be a big help to us if, if I get stumped. So um, I'm, I'm glad he's sitting up front. But uh, thank you all once again. On behalf of Secretary Fox and Maritime Administrator Chip Jenikin, I extend greetings from the United States Department of Transportation and MARAD. It is certainly to be an honor here among so many leaders and influencers within the automotive and shipping industries. And this is, kind of a very timely moment for the Maritime Administration to be talking with you in the automobile industry since the challenges and opportunities we are confronting dovetail precisely with those you are experiencing getting your product to market and a lot of what Therese just described to you is a very, very keen interest to us. Um, the name of the game is infrastructure. Compatibility, interconnectivity, versatility, modernization, and not to mention resilience. Maritime operators need to be equipped and able to ensure that our ports and shipping resources are equipped to load, transport, and unload vehicles whenever and wherever in the world the market demands and do it safely and efficiently. I can report that today, while there remains much work to do in the maritime sector, we are succeeding in achieving some of these goals. A few quick statistics. In 2015, 10.1 million tons of vehicles were moved through 40 U.S. ports equipped to handle automobiles. In two, also in 2015, 2,909 Roro ships made 7,065 port calls in those 40 ports. That's something we track very closely at, uh, at the Maritime Administration. I know the people who do that, too. Um, the top six ports for roll-on, roll-off calls were Tacoma, Palm Beach, New York, New Jersey, Brunswick, Jacksonville, and can anyone guess what the number one port is? I think you probably all know this, right? Baltimore. Rick, Rick's very happy for the shout out. Um, the, the Helen Delich Bentley port of Baltimore, and I should mention that uh, if for those of you who may not have known Helen, anyone who's involved in the maritime industry in Washington or certainly here in Baltimore, New Helen, uh, a congresswoman, started out in her, uh, her young career as a, uh, a newspaper reporter back in the 20s. Her beat was the Port of Baltimore, which was two things very unusual about that, a female reporter in those days and one that, that, uh, that worked the waterfront. So um, she was a, a member of Congress for many years and a very good friend to our industry. 
and a very good friend to me. And in fact, uh, whenever she, she saw me, she'd say, Mike, what are, you, what are you doing to save the U.S. Merchant Marine? And I'd have to give her a full report. I couldn't cut any corners. So um, it, we, we, do, we are going to miss Helen, and um, it, it's, it, it's, it's fitting that, that, uh, that, that we give her a little bit of a shout out. I'm sure she would appreciate it. She probably would say that I'm leaving a lot out, but uh, one, day, one day I'll correct all that. Anyway, <clears throat> um, so and it's fitting that we're holding this conference here in Baltimore because it's a leading port for servicing the automobile industry with roll-on, roll-off port calls. The Port of Baltimore is clearly making the right intermodal investments to prepare for that, for future that in very many ways is already here. Baltimore is first, the first port in the nation when it comes to handling automobiles, light trucks, farm and construction machinery, imported forest products, aluminum and sugar, and it is second in coal exports. So congratulations to Mr. White, who I, I understand couldn't be with us today, um, but congratulations to Mr. White and his team. And also, I would, sh I would also uh, point out to the men and women of the International Longshoremen's Association and, and the, the workers in the Port of Baltimore. So I think it's a credit to the entire team here. Um, you saw the future here in Baltimore. You did the work and undertook the strategic and collaborative planning with your elected officials and state transportation representatives to make the Port of Baltimore a model for the maritime community around the world, around the, the nation, and around the world, I would add. Uh, by developing this state-of-the-art port and multimodal transportation complex, you've connected seamlessly to rail and highways, you have helped to show the way forward, and exemplified the modern American port. At DOT and MARAD, we consider ourselves partners with you in this, and in fact, we did mention uh, very briefly uh, our Tiger grants that we're very pleased to have, uh, have been able to provide for the Port of Baltimore for some of their upgrades. Uh, we are deeply invested in the ongoing and aggressive upgrade and modernization of the nation's ports, rivers and waterways, the Great Lakes, and in maritime transport and technology. The Obama administration has been a great advocate and has worked with us to put ports on an even par with roads, highways, and rail projects for federal funding. And I'm certain that everyone understands that uh, everyone is competing um, for, uh, for federal dollars. Uh, transit, highways, you name it. Um, around the table at DOT, sometimes we have pretty, uh, pretty, <laughs> pretty uh, energetic discussions. But um, in recent years, we have allocated hundreds of millions of dollars toward multimodal port projects across the nation, specifically kind of an ag ag aggregate numbers, 706 million federal dollars have been matched with 960 million regional and private partnership investment dollars to build $1.6 billion of port and intermodal connector infrastructure. So we're very pleased at the leverage we get uh, in these partnerships with, uh, with the federal dollars that we're able to provide. We will continue to make these funds available because in the final analysis, it won't do for the automobile industry, our nation, it won't do us much good to enhance the port infrastructure in Baltimore if ports in Hampton Roads, New York, New Jersey, Providence, and Philadelphia, around the country, are not fully equipped, modernized, and just as importantly, networked one to another like strong links in a chain. And I, and I note on, uh, on the website for this conference the, uh, the term knitting together global trade. And of course, that's, uh, that's, that's the goal that we all have. Um, we are all looking to create a modern, integrated transportation system in our nation defined by a viable network of ports, rivers and waterways, vessels, container barges, uh, and carrier servicing satisfied customers. I would also add to that list the workforce. Um, I, I, I also noted um, uh, a shortage of truck drivers and, and having, that, uh, uh, having that sort of identified as an issue for the industry. Uh, we, have the similar, we have similar issues in maritime. So that kind of long-term commitment to investment just makes sense for the security and prosperity of our nation. Another of our primary objectives at MARAD is to promote an environment in which our community is working together, cooperating, developing new transportation strategies, serving customers like all of you through a finely tuned logistics and supply chain machine. Each port an integral part of the greater whole, each player clicking on all cylinders. You notice my, my metaphor. <laughs> Meanwhile, the automotive industry continues to grow and is a huge economic driver for our nation. However, there, are, there was another one. I, I, I might have gotten by you. <laughs> 
However, there are challenges. Our costs are rising, demand is shifting, and globalization is changing the competitive landscape. Manufacturers, distributors, and dealers are responding by examining every aspect of getting your product to the market. Through it all, think of us at the Maritime Administration, at the Department of Transportation, as uh, allies and partners. We see that as a nation, we are rediscovering the value of moving freight on the water. And I was so very pleased and, and, and watched with interest and listened with interest as Therese described uh, the short sea opportunities uh, from, uh, from the manufacturing centers in Mexico. Um, the stakes couldn't be more urgent. The future is here. And if we work together, collaborate, create, and invest, we can contribute to an ex economic renaissance in multimodal transportation that can lead the world. So once again, thank you all for the invitation. I look forward to our discussion. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Deputy Rodriguez, um, for sharing your thoughts there, and I think pointing very accurately to to the situations that, that you know we've talked about earlier with the collaboration here at places in ports like Baltimore is a good example of, of how um, different bodies work together, um, and of course uh, with things like like Tiger and and funding and, and support from the federal government can also also help support that growth. So we're very uh, pleased to have those messages there as well. Um, as we now have some time for, for Q&A, so um, it's going to be the usual format for those of you who are familiar with our events. Uh, we'll have a microphone going around. If you can just say your name and company, uh, we'll be glad to address the questions to our panel. Also, I should just mention, um, for those of you furiously taking notes for uh, Teresa's presentation, uh, it will be made available after the event. You'll, you'll get a, an email link with a, with a chance to, to see the presentations for everyone who makes them publicly available. Um, so is there any, any questions um, from the audience right now? And I do hate to break it to you. I have a whole page of them. So you know, I hope you, you filled up on coffee ahead of time, because we don't break early. Um, I'll start with one. Oh, sorry. Yeah, good. Right in the middle there. Yep. Brian Mason with Pace Automotive. Um, one of the questions for Teresa. Um, We've seen a, in a couple of instances where China exports have come way down. They did go through kind of a slump. And we're hoping they come back. But at the same time, what we're seeing is really a furious buildup of production capability in China. And so we're kind of tempering our expectations of how much that export market is going to come back for the US. Are, is PwC seeing something similar? Um, I would say on the whole, yes. Um, like you, you mentioned, there's a, a large um, buildup. It has been for quite some time. It will continue um, for OEMs to continue with their joint um, ventures in China to have local production. Again, build where you sell. It just makes more sense. Um, also, what we, we've been seeing in the past year and a half, two years, is the emergence of the domestic Chinese um, brands. And so what in that market, traditionally, the what they call the global OEMs, so you know Shanghai GM, um, and, and Shanghai Volkswagen, um, Beijing Benz, um, Brilliance BMW, all of the, the foreign companies um, to China have always dominated and had a competitive advantage. But what we're seeing is a very strong emergence of domestic brands as well in China. Um, part of that is due to their ability to, uh, part of their ability to adapt quickly to market changes and preferences and knowing their own market. Um, one thing I didn't mention here was the mix in China and how rapidly it's changing. Um, SUVs continue to grow at market <laughs> marketed levels, um, 46, 47% um, year to date in terms of segment. And it was a huge year for them last year too. And so a lot of these Chinese domestic companies are able to bring products faster um, that, that more cater or cater better to their consumers. And so these SUVs that they're building um, much more quickly that traditionally North America is kind of your SUV base. Um, if you think about BMW and Mercedes, that's where they have their global hubs are here in, in um, Tuscaloosa and Charleston or in Spartanburg. Um, most of the global OEMs don't like 
building larger vehicles like SUVs, utility vehicles in China. And so we are going to see um, kind of a, it's, it's, it is a more of a permanent shift, we would say, um, in terms of, you know, both the local assembly by those global OEMs as well as the domestic emergence um, kind of tempering those exports to China. So that's something that we, we definitely concur with as well. Mm-hmm. Maybe just following that up a little, um, connecting it to North America, because we've seen, obviously, Volvo start to import uh, a long-base vehicle into China, uh, sorry, into the U.S. from China, yeah. uh, as well as GM. Mm-hmm. Um, and with a stronger SUV base in, in China, would that potentially open up more opportunities for export to other markets where those vehicles are growing, whether it's the U.S. or Europe? I'm sorry, do you mean from China? From um, China to, to the US, North America, Europe? We don't see we don't see that much of a potential, at least in our forecast or in the foreseeable future, of Chinese domestic brands being able to break into um, not just the US market, but but markets abroad. This is a hurdle that they continue to face in terms of being able to enter markets. There's just a lot of barriers to entry outside of China for these brands, and we don't see any successful entry anytime soon for those. Um, in terms of Yes, there, there, there are imports coming in now. You said the long whale base um, S60. There's a handful of vehicles, the Buick Envision, coming in from China. Um, and we do see an incremental growth. We see potentially um, a forward nameplate coming in the next few years as well um, from China. We do see an uptick in that, but certainly not going to be something that is going to kind of take over the industry. There, there are some fears about that, and especially in, in election years. Um, there's some, you know, positioning and posturing about, you know, China coming, you know, for the U.S. In terms, of, in terms of the auto industry, we don't see that happening. Um, there's a lot of barriers, not just from a market entry standpoint, just purely you know, getting, getting the capital, setting up for the U.S. here, setting up a dealership network. There's a lot t- that they just won't be able to handle um, quite yet in, in terms of um, barriers to entry, but also just the perception, too. Uh, it's, it's hard to, I mean, even the Chinese market locally um, generally perceives the global OEMs at a much higher rate. Again, that's changing, as I mentioned. Um, the domestic brands are growing in quality and in, in brand um, value, but they certainly won't be able to, at least in our forecast window, be able to reach um, markets abroad. Okay. Yeah. Great. I promise we're going to come back onto some of those election year issues, but I'm going to spare you guys that for the moment, but only for the moment. <laughs> uh, any other questions uh, from the audience at this time? Yeah, we'll take one right in the front from Rick. If one of my lazy team members can just move a little bit quicker. <laughs> uh, Rick Powers from the Port of Baltimore. Uh, this is for Deputy Secretary Rodriguez. The fast track and Tiger funding. Is that going to supersede the election? Is that got a sunset uh, on those on those programs, or are they going to proceed for the for the future? Well, the um, the fast act funding is 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 going into the future, so that that'll that'll be there. Um, in terms of what we're doing at the department, we're very very active, very aggressively moving whatever grant money, whatever programs we we have. Um, they're trying to get all that all that money out the door to work and do do some good before uh, the sun goes down on this administration. So uh, the secretary is committed to it. All the staff of, uh, within the Department of Transportation, we at Marad um, are doing the same thing, and we, we're very engaged with the rest of the department uh, on on port on port projects. In fact, um, we've done very very well in terms of Tiger. Uh, just five five projects this last go around in Tiger Eight. Uh, for ports, so um, it's uh, it's a priority, and uh, and, a, and and to answer your question about the legislation, the the money is authorized uh, multi-year, so it will move ahead. Just to kind of also follow up on that uh, briefly, uh, for the for for Roro ports or other you know ports like in this room, what would you say are potential funding priorities from a from a Tiger point of view? What would you say to to those who might be interested in applying or, or, or taking advantage of this, or is that already kind of too late, or what, what would you kind of say? Uh, sort of how, how would, what are our criteria? Yeah. 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 Oh, um, well, we, we, uh, we look at projects that um, improve the state of good repair, um, improve capacity, economic impact. Uh, if, uh, if there are any folks in the room who are interested in the TIGER program, and it's a competitive, it's a competitive grant program, um, you can come and see us afterwards, and, uh, and we'll give you our contact information, and we'll have some folks uh, within our Office of Intermodal uh, Development uh, get, get in touch with you and kind of, kind of walk you through the process. 
Uh, it, another satisfied customer is shaking his head over there, Rick Power. Um, Thank you very much. Yeah, <laughs> so uh, uh, we have a, a number of folks in the Maritime Administration who will help you with the process, uh, let you know what the criteria are very, very clearly. We have, uh, within our Office of Intermodal Development, we have um, uh, something called Strong Ports, where we help uh, ports, particularly smaller ones, uh, that may not have the capacity or the, the staff to, to put together project planning and that kind of thing. We have folks who will help you within our Strong Ports program to look for financing, look for uh, uh, help with project development, help with monitoring the progress of the, of the project once it's underway. Uh, we also have within the department, we used to call it the Build America's Transportation Infrastructure Center. Uh, now it's called the Building America Bureau. Um, but that does essentially the same thing in a department-wide sort of context where uh, uh, interested parties can come, get information, get help going through the regulatory processes, looking for financing, just about everything you need to do. It's a one-stop shop uh, for just about everything you need to know to, uh, to begin a project, a project, get it moving, and complete it. So um, we have a number of resources within the department and at the Maritime Administration to help with all that. Thank you. Questions, comments from the audience? Going back to um, Teresa for a moment here. Um, last year at this conference, actually, um, and then several following, um, your colleague Brandon Mason presented some forecasts on the potential import scenario into the US over the next several years, particularly the impact that Mexico may have on global imports, finished vehicle imports. So I mean, in one, in one possible scenario, he saw perhaps 50% uh, up to a 50% decline, potentially, uh, at least deep sea, right? Um, I wondered if, if that's still a scenario that PwC is, is looking at, playing with, or how you see that potentially developing. Um, we definitely, with the, the continued localization, we definitely do see the potential for in, imports to continue declining. Um, I, know, I know exactly what slide you're <laughs> <laughs> referencing. Um, and that's a bit of a, you know, that's a, not that it's an extreme scenario, but it would be if, you know, if we're considering that all of the assembly localization is replacing um, imports, in which naturally it, it's not going to. Um, there's always going to be imports from, from Germany. There's always going to be imports from Japan. Um, so we don't see it, you know, plummeting and, and declining by, you know, or, or being eliminated in general. Um, but we do see that, yes, with, with the continued growth of Mexico, non-NAFTA imports will, will likely um, decline. Again, deep, o deep ocean not coming from, you know, between yeah. Mexico and U.S. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Um, and circling back to the election, so who are you voting for? No, I'm not just kidding. No. Um, the, one, one of the things that, that looks likely one way or another, or at least is being said, we, we, you know, what's being said and what will be done will probably be different from both either candidate, I suppose. But TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, seems to be off the table if you go by what's being said from both candidates. Uh, potential renegotiations of NAFTA seem to be potentially there. So starting with, with, with Teresa, what, what does things like that potentially impact on your medium-term forecast. Obviously, we can't totally predict. And, and then, you know, for the deputy, I mean, I know it's probably complicated to comment on, on politics, but going back to the, to the point of perhaps a little bit what Rick alluded to, I mean, how much, with some of the potentially radical things being said in this campaign here, what, you know, how stable are, can, can we expect the, the regulatory and funding outlook that you know, your department has been presenting? So maybe we can start with Teresa on that. Um, so yes, I believe both, both candidates, both leading candidates have said that they um, are, neither of them are, are um, supporters of TPP. So the TPP, you've got to look at it from a few levels. Um, the 11 countries involved from an import-export standpoint of, of finished vehicles, it's really the primary markets that are even matter of those 11 are going to be the U.S., Japan, and Canada. Um, Canada is a shrinking assembly market for us, and so not much volume there in terms of, you know, significance. Um, but Japan, historically, the U.S. has met several different barriers um, in terms of being able to import into Japan, so export our vehicles into um, Japan, and those go beyond and are outside of, you know, the TPP never really did anything to address that, um, any of the, and it's not trade tariffs that they use um, to prevent a lot of that import um, into Japan. There's all sorts of different regulations from a local standpoint. There's only um, so many um, non-Japanese vehicles that can be within a municipality. There's lots of different um, 
legislative moves, I guess, if you, if you could say, that they use that, that go beyond just tariffs and, and trade. And so from a finished vehicle standpoint, we don't see that the TVP would have ever made that much of a difference. It was a lot of political posturing. Um, but what does um, impact from an auto standpoint is going to be at the supplier level. Um, so part of the TPP has, um, part of the, the contentious um, element of it is the country of origin requirement. And so countries within the TPP agreement would have had a lower standard of, of country of origin. So what you could have seen is, is an undercutting, I guess, if you will, of um, some of the suppliers um, here to getting from getting them from lower cost countries. Um, so that's where you would see more of an impact is at the supplier level. Um, so if that doesn't pass, you would still um, have to reach a higher percentage. And th that number has changed several times um, over the course of the TPP development. But it would still be, um, I believe it's close to 70% requirement that the parts of your that can constitute your vehicle have to a certain percentage has to come from um, countries within the TPP and without that then you would lose that requirement and that would be a little bit more open and, and more favorable to existing suppliers um, th yeah. that's really the primary yeah. impact Got it. well f from our point of view the um, TPP to the extent that it would it would open trade and, and increase volumes through our ports. That's uh, that's certainly what we're we're tracking very very closely. Something else, uh, there are some provisions in it for e-commerce that uh, that we're very interested in. I I think sort of underlying um, some of my remarks in terms of networking ports together is uh, this whole idea of information sharing and uh, you know how do we how do we do that. Uh, effectively um, within the, su the supply chain. So we're, we're we're very supportive, obviously, that through the, the administration's effort in TPP. Um, we're, we're, we're looking very closely at what the effect would be in our, in our nation's ports. Uh, in terms of um, regulation, and I think your question was, you know, how do you see that going forward? The work that we do at the Maritime Administration is kind of unique. We, we, as I mentioned before, we have our strong ports program. Uh, we work very closely closely with the uh, with the uh, the Building America Bureau now up at the at the Department of Transportation. What we do is try to put people together, um, and certainly when when we make investment decisions um, at, in ports, there's there's a uh, folks at the state level, folks at the local level, communities are all involved. So at the Maritime Administration, we're very involved with trying to put all those people together to make a project work. So I don't see that changing at all. And in fact, I think, uh, I think that kind of skill amongst our, our, uh, our staff, the people that we have at, at the Maritime Administration, that, that skill to sort of bridge gaps and work together with people across, uh, across the whole spectrum of stakeholders is going to be very valuable no matter who mm -hmm. is elected president. So, Thank you. Further comments, questions from the audience? Um, of course, another, another from my side. Uh, oh, sorry, I missed. Right here in the front, sorry. We'll have a mic coming up from behind you there. Tom Porcelli, Adcock, Northeast Auto Transport. Uh, Teresa, the question I have is back to China. Some of the obstacles that you mentioned with setting up the dealer networks, how closely do you follow or have a prediction of when you think they may get the opportunity to get into the U.S.? And one of the biggest concerns that I had heard was that they cannot keep up with the safety standards of the U.S. That's certainly um, probably one of the primary, you know, from a vehicle quality and safety standpoint, um, that's, that's a significant barrier um, for a lot of the Chinese brands. Um, we do try to track that. It's a bit of a guessing game. I mean, you've had several um, Chinese brands already announced that they were, they'd be attempting to enter the market. We just haven't ever seen that being able to, to come to fruition. Um, from a timeline standpoint, certainly not in our forecast. I would say, I mean, I think what a lot of people are keeping an eye on right now is how Tesla is dealing with, with the dealership and franchising um, laws in terms of state by state. I mean, this is something that, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a battle times 50, right, in, in terms of being able to, you know, from a sales standpoint, set up that network. And so if there's a favorable move, you know, away from the dealership model and more towards a direct sales model, then I would think that the Chinese would have a better chance at entering the market. Um, but right now, the capital and the resources involved that would require, um, or that would be required to, to establish themselves not only as a, a, a quality and a safety brand, but also one that can sell in, in the States would be difficult. Um, I, I would 
say not not in the near future. <laughs> it would be very difficult. And you know, with every you know success that the Chinese brands have, there's usually you know, if if you follow any of the auto type of blogs and forums, there's there's always um, quite humorous stories about safety and things that you know are, are lacking um, from some of the vehicles that are within that market. So I would say it would not in the near future. Thank you. I wanted to um, circle on to the uh, port trade with U.S. and Mexico, as, as Therese mentioned too. But first, to, um, to Michael, um, to what extent uh, does your department look potentially collaborate with other ports in North America or other with, across maritime on a regulatory, on standard side, um, whatever might be necessary to help facilitate this, this kind of trade? So we, we, at the Maritime Administration, we don't really have a, a regulatory function. In fact, I was talking with, uh, with one of the other participants here today, and, and they uh, very, uh, I'm going, going to steal a term, uh, we're influencers. So I, I kind of like that one. I'm going to see if I can get it into our, into our, uh, our communications. Um, but that's, that's certainly what we do, and that's, and that's our strength. Um, in terms of, I was very interested in, the, in, the, uh, in your discussion, Therese, um, uh, regarding the the trade between the manufacturers in Mexico and and uh, and the United States, so what we would do in a situation like that is uh, is work with a port, whether it's a, a large one or a small one, uh, doesn't matter, um, to sort of build that kind of capacity to to handle that traffic. Um, you know, maybe maybe there's some specialization, the kind of equipment that has to be used on, on a short sea uh, service like that. Uh, we have some folks who are technical experts in that. We have, um, as I mentioned, our, uh, our intermodal port development um, uh, office is, is very good at putting people together to, f to find the resources that they need to put those services together. So um, in terms of when that, that product, those Im imports, will arrive here in the United States, how does that get uh, distributed? We, we work again on, uh, on finding resources for intermodal projects. Um, improving intersections, those kinds of things. So as, as that trade, if that trade were to grow, I could see the Maritime Administration playing a very important role in putting together, again, all the stakeholders and trying to find the resources to make those improvements. Thank you. And I appreciate PwC Autofax is, is you know, core is production forecasting and, and, and this side, um, and that some of your slides had a had a very reputable source, I'd point out, uh, in Finnish vehicle logistics. Although, if you noticed any inaccuracies, it was all PwC. Um, the, um, but are you starting, or and this may be something for discussion in other sessions, are you looking in, into whether the investment from the port side versus the rail side, you know, w w to keep up with is growth? Because if you were to um, speak to Kansas City Southern or to Ferromex, um, they'll they'll point to multi-billion dollar capital investments to to protect that 87 percent or of 82 percent or whatever the thing was market share. Uh, at the same time that some of the Mexican ports in particular might might be struggling in a in, in a funding environment, especially with the petrol price low and you know the government facing constraints. So um, might there there be a case where the rail just can really out outspend uh, outspend the ports simply in a sense? Oh, probably. I, I need to preface that. Um, probably can't speak to it in, in yeah. terms of you know. It, certainly, there's there's. It's a very complicated. What I've learned in some of the consulting projects that we've we've completed recently, it's a very complicated relationship between the rails, the ports, the processors, and, and the local municipalities as well. Um, but certainly, I think um, rail is is the easiest and and currently the most used, and so probably has more access to that, that, that would make sense to me. Um, but I can't speak to the, some of the difficulties like that you mentioned at the port level, probably yeah. not comfortable. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> I can yeah. certainly find out a little <laughs> bit more. Um, we have a, a very large logistics practice yeah. um, that, like I said, is getting uh, fielding a lot of inquiries and questions in terms of both you know, on the rail yeah. side, the port side, as well as the processor side, um, in terms of you know, strategy um, type of projects. And yeah. so I can definitely connect. If anyone has specific questions, I can definitely connect folks um, to the right people for that. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mostly wanted to throw it out because I do think uh, some other people in the room and other sessions will perhaps have more to say on things like that. So it's something we'll continue to, to discuss, I'm sure. I think we have a question uh, in the back there. To Marty, yeah. Thank you very much. Marty Kolbeck from Auto Warehousing. Question, Teresa. Uh, 
you pointed out the ports down in Mexico uh, and the capacity that's going out to those ports right now, those ports seem to be constrained. What's your forecast on their completing the improvements, for example, at uh, Tampico and Altamira and, and Veracruz in order to accommodate the, the volumes that are going to come at them? And what is your projection for the volumes that are going to be coming out of the West Coast and the East Coast, the increase versus what's going on now? Um, as I mentioned, we, we don't have a forecast, especially in Autofax, we don't have a forecast specifically for the um, volumes coming in and out of the ports. Um, we've had a few studies recently, um, actually ongoing, that are evaluating that, um, but I, ca I can't speak to those. Those are um, outside of the, the Autofax realm, but certainly um, there's going to be, like you said, there's going to need to be a certain level of investment. Um, I know Vera Cruz is, I believe, based on FBL statistics in their port survey, um, is struggling in terms of, it's certainly the largest port, but it's, it's maxing out in terms of capacity. And so to be able to handle this volume, I think there's going to need to be an investment across the board, both at the port level, the rail, um, across the amounts. So. No doubt a lot of questions on, on that side. Um, Michael, maybe from the US perspective, are you, are you tracking, obviously we talked about Tiger and uh, allocated funds from, from FASTAC, but, um, do you have much of a view on how much port investment is keeping up with sort of demand? And I don't necessarily just mean an automotive here. I mean, looking out over the long term, we see a lot of capital investment in the railroads in, in the U.S., perhaps some, some struggles on the road. Um, is the port picture sort of positive in its investment or is it sort of facing a, a potential deficit over the coming years? Well, I, I think, um, no, thank you for the, for the question. I, I think FAST Act with some of its focus on freight and certainly the, the focus that the department has put on um, freight transport in the United States has opened up the debate on, uh, on the different modes. And uh, we're very excited about the focus it's, it has put on, on, the, on the maritime mode. So to answer your question, no, we don't have enough investment in our, uh, in our infrastructure overall and not enough in our, in our maritime um, uh, infrastructure. But we're very, very uh, encouraged by, well, certainly this administration has given it a lot of attention. Um, it's getting attention in Congress more so than, than perhaps uh, it has in the past. So the trend is uh, going in our direction. And as we, as we begin to wrestle even more, um, uh, even more with, uh, with our congestion issues, I think, uh, I think more people will be will be uh, looking at the maritime mode as a, as a solution. So we're very encouraged by where we are right now. Does that sort of also preclude or, or mandate uh, making it easier or, or encouraging more private private investment side or even foreign direct investment? Well, I, I, uh, in terms of foreign investment, I'm not, I'm not quite sure all, all the rules. It's, yeah. it's kind of not, not <laughs> in my area. But, uh, but certainly partnerships are a, are, are a huge part of this. And, and some of the figures that I, I did in my talk um, I, I gave in my talk or, you know, just looking at, we have, I think there's no secret, there are going to be limited federal dollars for some time to come. Uh, we're going to be challenged. Uh, so we're looking for ways within the, within the, uh, uh, the federal government to make those, those dollars that we do have provide as much value as possible. So um, the, the, the public-private partnerships, that model is going to be extremely important going forward. Any last comments or question from the audience? I've got just one more for Teresa, because you talked about the alternative fuel not being quite what it was. Obviously, we've seen a big shift towards SUV crossover, much higher than was expected. There was some talk recently about maybe some changes in the cafe requirements over the next 10 years, but also some pushback that maybe not. Um, so from a, from a, and also obviously in the wake of Dieselgate, um, maybe, maybe there's even more regulatory focus coming in. How do you see that playing out over the, over the coming years? Do you, do you see a, a stronger regulatory kind of turn of the, of the screw there? I'll speak, I guess, more on the U.S., because um, that's my focus. Yeah, and, yeah that's, and, that's what right. I mean, yeah. Um, we're at an interesting point. So as you mentioned, um, sales mix has shifted right back to light trucks with the low um, gas prices at the pump. Everyone's going big again. Um, and alternative vehicles, I think, did through July are down something like 8%. Um, it's it's going to be interesting because you've got two kind of competing um, 
wills, if you will. So from an OEM standpoint, bigger is better in terms of prop profits, right? And, and, and that's what, you know, bottom line, that's what you want. But at the same time, um, you've got these looming standards that, as you mentioned, it's gone back and forth. There's no real indication of whether or not the 2025 standards are going to um, be changed or not. There's push on both sides. Um, so OEMs and regulatory um, bodies are going to have to think about whether or not we're going to need more, I would say, coercive measures to push that, that consumer adoption because the, the, here in the U.S. at least, the, the plain truth is that mass penetration just hasn't, you know, from a consumer acceptance standpoint, um, from a, you know, investment standpoint, paying that price premium for your hybrids and your, your alternative vehicles, that just hasn't paid out. Um, and, and consumers don't feel like they're getting the, the bang for their buck for, for those vehicles. And so unless you can change that, whether that's through more generous incentives, which there already are incentives um, for, for alternative vehicles, but more incentives, perhaps OEMs would, would need to, to avoid excessive fines, would need to um, change their product mix and make less of those large vehicles available. There's, there's going to need to be some sort of um, corrective measure if we continue at this pace. Now, of course, you know, oil prices are kind of, it all hinges around oil prices. The lack of, you know, huge um, gas taxes for us means we feel those fluctuations right away at the gas pump. So you see that, um, that shift immediately from a segment standpoint, but it's going to be interesting on how, not just the OEMs, but from, you know, a regulatory standpoint, how that's going to play out in terms of what measures are, are needed to help push consumers more towards those vehicles. Okay. So I think that's probably on that, that uncertain future look there, we'll, we'll probably uh, draw a line under our session. Uh, but I would like to thank both of our panelists for, for their time and insight. The Deputy Administrator mentioned that if you're interested in, in getting in touch about the Tiger funding or other information, then by all means do. Uh, if they have to leave soon, I'm sure we can connect you. If that's okay, you know, we're, we're happy to play that role um, insofar as possible. Uh, we'll have some coffee, so some chance to network. We're back in here at 11. We're going to be talking more about specifically about infrastructure, including with some practitioners in the industry. So join us then. Thank you. Thank you.